exploration, quote, in a manner that is ethically sensitive to the cultural differences and geopolitical complexities of the contemporary age. This issue is inevitably connected to the very nature of comparison in uh, a broader sense as a cognitive and analytical tool and a way of reading the world. The comparative impetus, although possibly of universal nature, takes on more specificity in the context of early modern European expansionism, but also becomes more prominent in the 19th century discourse of science and the knowledge formations that themselves became legacies of European imperialism. Thus, the comparative thrust in the natural sciences of the time was linked to the emergent structuralist analysis, while the comparative element in the humanities and specifically in comparative literature remains somewhat muddled. As late as in 1963, René Thiebaud contended in Comparison et Parison um, that in fact, there was no agreement on the object or the method for the discipline, uh, which he referred to in quotation marks as um, a science. Traditionally, the act of comparison and comparativism implied externalization, the movement outward, reaching outward another national literature, another author in a different language, another culture, and so forth. In fact, there is an inherent comparative impetus in any such movement outward, including a moment of cultural contact. It may be productive, however, counter to the demands of the age of globalization, which insists on shrinking distances and on offering more connections than ever, to entertain a type of comparative engagement that presupposes and in fact necessitates a centripetal movement, an inward gaze that recognizes the differences inherent in any object of study. And I want to say that that's something that came up in our discussion on Friday, if you may remember. Reflecting on the way contemporary critical perspectives and disciplinary slash interdisciplinary concerns are changing the way we think about our discipline may also be relevant with regard to the very object of comparison and the evolving understanding of the nature of comparative thinking and comparative analysis. And so here I'm drawing on the contentions of Ali Beidad um, from one of his Canadian lectures, but also uh, it, is, um, it is part of his other publications. So he reflects in the following way, the comparative frame of mind is defined by the, oops, sorry, I skipped the page, is defined by the fundamental insight that any cultural production is inherently heterogeneous and hence requires no external object of comparison. Put otherwise, a comparative frame of mind does not require the co-presence of two or more cultural or literary archives or art artifacts in practicing comparative literature for any single object can be read in relation to or even against its own context. Relatedly, a comparative frame of mind also takes seriously the arbitrariness of the divisions drawn among cultural productions and may even make uh, the problematization of genre categories the object of analysis itself. Thus, a critical reading of an object of comparison may not necessarily be horizontal, linear, and structural, for example, comparing text A to text B, but rather vertical and rhizomatic, where it lays bare its own complex layers, its intertextual and dialogic nature, emphasizing the inherent situatedness of the object of study at the intersection of a multiplicity of voices and discourses at the junction of past, present, and future. Thus, any text, whether literary or other, is always already situated on potentially comparative ground. Everything and anything is comparative under the critical scrutiny of a culturally and historically conscious reader. This becomes particularly salient in the context of colonial relations, whether with possible prefixes, post, neo, and, and so forth, and settler colonial cultures. As in any settler colonial state, the origins of the discipline of comparative literature are rooted in the dominant colonial language and culture. And in the Canadian context, in the competing for power of the two main settler languages, English and French. And so the bilingual context creates preconditions for what may seem as an inherently comparative cultural context, albeit solidly European. In the mid 20th century, at the roots of comparative literature as an academic discipline in Canada, its main project as elsewhere in the West was primarily European cultural paradigm and its various permutations, 
sustained by the scholars from various parts of Europe that came to be at the foundational beginnings of the discipline in Canada. In 1988, Edward Blodgett, one of the prominent Canadianists and comparatists in one of his seminal essays, spoke of the many ironies of the dominance of English, as it was primarily the language adopted by new immigrant communities who inevitably left their imprint on this language, while others continued writing and creating their first languages. While historically the main purview of comp comparative Canadian literature was the relationship between the Anglophone and Francophone literatures of Canada, he called for the acknowledgement of the role of minority and indigenous languages. He contended that the concept of Canadian literature itself, quote, carries a burden that it can no longer bear, unquote. And the very title of his essay posited that key argument, Canadian literature is comparative literature. To return to the issue of bilingualism, however, it should be noted that it is hardly ever neutral and is commonly marked by historically um, uneven power relations. Speaking of the relationality between the Francophone and Anglophone cultural spheres, Sherry Simon, who uh, is a contributor to the area of cultural translation, contends that bilingualism is never symmetrical. Linguistic practices in a cultural landscape that includes more than one language always involve negotiating power structures and power relations, whether historically shaped or recently emerging. And in one of her interviews, she suggests that in fact, the two solitudes, the term coined by the novelist Hugh McLennan in um, 1948, is not in fact the thing of the past. The conceptual apparatus of translation studies in its broad application may be a productive tool for reading Canadian cultural continuum as a complex translational space that enables explorations along historical, political, cultural, and linguistic axes, re-examining the country's complex history, turning um, attention to minority languages, diasporic cultural production, and indigenous languages and cultures. And it seems that the recent disciplinary and conceptual affinities of comparative literature, think of cultural and material terms, uh, and so also this goes for translation studies, open spaces for a new conversation and uh, translational um, approaches and the conceptual apparatus of translation studies may be of particular use here. So I am probably going to condense a little bit my, um, my segment on translation studies, but I just would like to emphasize a few key uh, kind of productive analytical tools. Um, for example, Emily Apter's, um, I'm referring to her 2006 publication, idea of neighboring languages, literatures, and communities of speakers, the neighborhoods being defined by contiguity and ethical encounter, rather than by similitude and cultural influence. Um, Susan Bassnett contends that translation studies and comparative literature are not disciplines, but rather methods of approaching the study of text. And that seems to be a particularly relevant and um, I think um, productive strategy for today's comparative literature. Um, thus, um, world literature, the work of comparatism and translation studies exist in an inherently symbiotic relation, focusing on and exploring, uh, quote, quoting from Bestnet 2014, global literary and cultural flows and specifically questions of agency, which become particularly important. Another thing I would like to emphasize, and that's something that, again, it was has already been brought up in, in our panel, other concepts uh, such as incomparables and untranslatables, referring to Aptos 2013, um, a book that uh, perhaps has acquired some notoriety which may seem as a productive currency in a disciplinary discourse um, while bringing more nuance and cultural sensitivity to comparative undertakings. While the title of the book explicitly plays on opposition and negation, the critique itself has a productive core to it as Aptor's key argument is against the historically constructed comparability and universality of world literature and for the recognition of a multiplicity of models and practices that inform and enrich each other at the very locus of difference. 
These considerations have broader implications for pedagogy, um, world and comparative literature curricula and scholarly practices. Translational cultural movements, production of text, their circulation, flow and exchange in their multilingual lives necessarily situate comparative literary inquiry along with translation studies in the context of, um, I want to use here the conceptual apparatus of Shumeishi, the relational world. And um, I'm just kind of trying to keep track of time. I would like to mention uh, two key publications, very recent ones, that contribute to um, the conversation on the theory and practice of comparative literature in Canada, uh, one of which was mentioned um, by Shumei, but I probably don't want to dwell too much on um, the work that uh, I myself co-edited. The other volume being um, a critical collection entitled Comparative Literature for the New Century, uh, this collection edited by De Gasperi and Pivado argues that Canadian, um, as well as broader North American context, may well shape the future of direction for comparative literary studies, which emphasize the importance of languages and is grounded in a growing plurilinguistic and pluricultural sensibility. Thus, the, uh, this contribution proposes the project of a new comparative literature at the intersection of translation, translingualism, um, negotiation between Anglo and Francophone literary studies, non literary media studies, ethnic minority writing, and diasporic writing. The editors emphasize that more work, um, more comparative work needs to be done with the literary works of indigenous authors in North America, which also may involve work with indigenous languages. Um, while comparative literature in Canada has long demonstrated its investment in um, uh, this particular approach, the recent interventions in the narrative of Canadian history, explorations of truth and reconciliation practices, and the growing political complexity of the globalized world open new critical venues and ethical responsibilities. Issues of indigeneity, um, culture, cultural inclusion and redress have been prominent concerns on the recent socio-political and cultural scene in Canada. The most important development to date in the narrative of the indigenous and settler relations is the work of the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, which concluded its work in 2015. It was tasked with documenting the history and impact on the indigenous population of the government residential school system, whose practices have been equated with cultural genocide. After seven years of private and public meetings with the survivors of residential schools and, um, um, and other agents, the findings of the commission were presented in a multi-volume set of documents and made available online. The work of healing indigenous communities and their relationship with many levels of community nation with which they interact uh, involves, uh, this um, involves revitalizing, I'm quoting here, individuals as well as indigenous cultures, languages, spirituality, laws, and governance systems. For governments, building a respectful relationship involves dismantling a centuries old political and bureaucratic culture in which all too often, policies and programs are still based on failed notion of, of assimilation. And this was from a document entitled What We Have Learned from 2015. The narrative of the TRC poses new challenges for Canadian comparative cultural and um, literary studies to foster and build new connections, both in terms of pedagogy and scholarship. Gradual opening of a dialogue between writers, artists, scholars may be an important part of this what we can refer to probably as a decolonizing process. One example of such recent work is um, McFarland and Raffles' uh, introduction to indigenous literary criticism in Canada, um, which combines contributions on the issues of colonialism, appropriation, resistance, language, orality, pan-indigenous experience and ethics in scholarship. Our National Association's journal uh, has been very actively involved in this ongoing conversation across various disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and media, intermedia boundaries. For example, one of the recent special issues was devoted to truth and reconciliation practices in a comparative perspective, drawing on the experiences in Canada and South Africa. Um, another special issue was devoted to environmental ethics and activism in indigenous literature and film, where uh, according to the editors, uh, they examined the discourses, aesthetics and knowledges that are emerging at the intersection of public protest, artistic expression and environmental ethics. 
To return briefly to the two critical volumes on the contributions um, of theory and practice in Canada that I already mentioned, I would like to revisit the idea of non-engagement with the master narratives and theory um, that was mentioned was brought up yesterday by uh, Shumay. Uh, of course, you know, understanding that this theory would be West-centric. And so perhaps this, this concept would be useful speaking about these two volumes. Um, I'm not sure if I would qualify them necessarily as a kind of a conscious gesture, specifically a conscious political gesture. Perhaps it's simpler to say that uh, these publications betray other concerns that are more pressing and more and have more relevant matters at hand. How does comparative literature work with the model of language departments, which appear to be uh, perhaps the only viable models uh, at present? What are the many and various languages of comparative literature across the disciplines and media? How does the increasing trend of digitization of academic libraries and the gradual decrease of the print format reflect on the preservation of knowledge in the new format and who decides what stays and what goes? What kind of new knowledges does it create? Continuing with the issues of praxis, in the context of the very troubling and increasingly more pronounced neoliberalization of the university as an institution that responds to the ever-shrinking budgets and the dictates of the market, we are dealing with a radical decline in academic structures, such as undergraduate and graduate degrees in comparative literature, within which the discipline has been traditionally housed. Neoliberalization of the university has direct implications also for the new neoliberalization of knowledge, its creation, dissemination, and in fact, its very nature. Without belaboring the much discussed present plight of the humanities, it suffices to say that the implications of these developments for small disciplines such as comparative literature are in fact um, dire. With only a handful of universities still offering comparative literature in Canada, how do we ensure its continual vitality? And um, to wrap up my discussion, I am aware of the time. I would like to um, echo Shumay's contention yesterday about the paradox of comparative literature reflected in its weakening as an institutional presence, but also its simultaneous growth and strengthening as an intellectual presence. And I would like to emphasize that the latter manifests itself not just in the changing landscape of scholarship, but in its very practical applications. Um, it is about how and what we teach, how we read with our students, what methodological and analytical tool we offer, and what kind of knowledges we foster. And Leah, this leaves us with uh, a number of questions, and probably one of those would be in the context of the increasing constraints and limitations of institutional structures. How do we move beyond these constraints? In other words, how do we do comparative literature today? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Irene, for that all-encompassing uh, discussion about comparative literature in Canada. Uh, the U.S. American, U.S. comparative literature has so much to learn from Canadian comparative literature because in the U.S. we have not yet confronted our own settler colonial reality in the field of comparative literature. So thank you very much. It's very interesting that actually today uh, three of the presentations are coming from settler colonies, uh, Canada, New Zealand, and Taiwan. Um, it was not an, perhaps it was not an accident that uh, three scholars from settler colonies are speaking today. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Jacob Edmund, who is a professor in the Department of English and Linguistics and at the University of Otago, uh, New Zealand. He's the author of two books and seven uh, edited volumes. Uh, the 2012 book, uh, which uh, received honorary mention from ACLA's Harry Levine Prize, is entitled A Common Strangeness, Contemporary Poetry, Cross-Cultural Encounter, Comparative Literature. His 2019 book is entitled Make It the Same, Poetry in the Age of Global Media. And among many uh, edited uh, volumes, uh, he uh, edited a special issue of comparative literature studies entitled The Indiscipline of Comparison. Uh, so here, uh, Professor Edmund's uh, presentation is entitled The Dirty Word, A View on Comparison 
from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Please. Thank you very much, Shume, um, um, and thank you and well for your um, for your invitation for me to speak here. Um, and uh, uh, an apology to the, to you both and to the rest of the seminar that I have been unable to attend the other days. So it's, it's about 2 a.m. here in, in New Zealand, and because of that and other commitments, I haven't been able to uh, make the other sessions. But I, I'm sorry I've missed out on that rich discussion, but I'm hope, I understand it's being recorded and I hope to catch up on it. In any case, uh, Irene's this first paper today, wonderful paper, um, uh, is a wonderful segue to mine because I too am going to be as Shume said, not just um, speaking from a settler colonial uh, perspective, <clears throat> but, but also um, uh, touching on, on the importance of, of, of indigenous uh, peoples and cultures. Um, I'm going to uh, try and do the share screen just to, because I'm going to show a couple of images uh, during the talk. That's okay. Hopefully this will work. Um, Are you able to see that, everyone? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, I'll begin. Comparative literature is not just institutionally almost non-existent in this country. It is also hard to see how it could be otherwise. Seen from this country, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, Comparative literature, especially in its new or renewed world or planetary guises emanating from North America and Europe over the past few decades, often looks suspiciously like another version of Anglo-European colonialism and imperialism, another extract industry in which the West, now often the North, exploits the resources of the rest. Such a critique, for instance, lies behind Lisa Tuhiwai Smith's decolonizing methodologies, uh, which is written out of the author's frustration at the exploitation of Maori and under, other indigenous peoples by largely white researchers, and which has resonated broadly amongst and beyond indigenous scholarly communities around the world. In that book, Tuhiwai Smith writes that the word itself, research, is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. Terms like comparative literature, world literature, and global modernism name a research agenda that emanates largely out of the Euro-American and settler colonial world, but which takes the entire world, including indigenous cultures, as its purview. If these terms were considered at all by Tuhiwai Smith, they might therefore be taken to name the dirtiest kind of research, the dirtiest of dirty words. And yet, while comparison here in Aotearoa New Zealand is arguably a dirty word, it is impossible here not to be a comparatist. If by that we mean someone who must grapple on a daily basis, as Tuhiwai Smith does, with the politics and geopolitics of unequal encounters between languages, cultures, and intersectional identities, and with the insidious histories and ongoing power of racialized and gendered ideologies and prejudice. It is equally a comparative perspective uh, that has led to the uptake of Tuhiwai Smith's critique in a wide range of contexts, and that more generally enables forms of transnational solidarity against historical and contemporary imperialism, colonialism, racism, and other forms of oppression that cross borders. Comparison then appears as both problem and cure, a dirty word that we cannot do without whoever we are, and yet one that comes with ingrained layers of imperial and colonial history. The lesson that I draw from my experience in Aotearoa New Zealand is this, that instead of continuing the, the expansionary line of recent decades, Instead of colonizing more and more of the world's literatures, languages, and cultural materials, comparative literature as a discipline must listen and learn from others and allow those other voices and perspectives to draw into question its concepts, theories, and practices, including the terms comparative and literature. As a white colonial settler scholar from Aotearoa New Zealand, 
It is particularly important for me to learn something from listening to the writings, voices, and perspectives of indigenous Māori writers and scholars. Listening, listening to these voices means recognizing that in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as I had it, has it in many other places, the notion of literature has been too narrowly drawn. Even after you know, 50 years of cultural studies, even after um, the, the many ways in which comparative literature as a discipline has been expanded. Um, but I think you know, this is particularly true in a, in a country, a rather small country like New Zealand. So for instance, Maori fiction writer and scholar Tina Makareti contrasts the way in which Maori literature is taught in English departments with the way in which she conceives of Maori literature. According to Makareti, writing in 2018, English departments at New Zealand universities tend to begin with and stress imported English literature. New Zealand literature might include a smattering of 19th and early 20th century texts, but as Makareti writes, it really begins uh, in, in the English, English departments with white colonial settler modernist writers. And Makareti goes on, the principle is that written literature arrived in the late 18th century with European settlers, that New Zealand literature emerged sometime in the early 20th century, maybe late 19th if you're particularly progressive, and that Māori literature arrived sometime in the 1960s with Hone Tūwhari's No Ordinary Son, uh, first uh, celebrated as the first book of, of, of poetry written by a Māori author published in, in English, and with Ihe Maira's Paunamu Paunamu from 1972, a novel. And these was, are seen often as signaling the beginning of written Māori li English, literature in English. This approach assumes that Māori were not creating substantial literature before this point. Despite um, a plethora of recent scholarship by Māori challenging this assumption, in New Zealand literature, Makabiti concludes, Māori literature is invariably placed as a subsection of New, Ze New Zealand literature, which is still a regional subsection of English literature and a late arriving one at that. By contrast, I was trying to make it, well, it's okay. By contrast, Makareti offers a radically different understanding of Māori literature in English and how it should be taught so that scholars understand where it comes from and what it is saying. She presents a whakapapa or genealogy of Māori literature that includes a network of orally recorded stories, genealogies and histories, whakapapa, Nga Purako, Nga Korero Tukuiho, ritualized calls and speeches, Karanga, by Korero, songs, Waiata, Oreore, Motiatia, for Cairo or carvings, Tamoko or tattoos, Raranga or weaving, Māori newspapers and other media and genres, including modern and contemporary film, theatre, and art. Makareti presents Māori literature as both a genealogy and as a network. Uh, in order to mark the ongoing existence of all these forms and their continuously expanding into relationships. This effort to redefine literature is nothing new amongst Māori scholars. Tuhiwai Smith, for instance, cites Nguye at Yongo as efforts to redefine literature in Kenya from the 1960s onwards, and also citing the example of Nairobi University in the early 1970s Te Kapunga Matemuana or Koro Jews sought to redefine literature to include Waiata Haka, a word often translated as action songs, but which Jews himself tended to call song poetry or dance poetry. His MA thesis on this song or dance poetry was the first ever to be written in Maori, though Jews gave it the English title Maori literature. In the thesis and elsewhere in his writings, Jews makes it clear that for him, recognizing these works as Maori literature is key to the recognition of the status of the Maori language. In 1972, for instance, around the time he completed his thesis, Jews helped lead a campaign and petition to Parliament for the teaching of Maori language in New Zealand schools. Published in 1974, Jews' thesis includes a forward by Aparana Mahuika, which frames the claim to literary status as precisely a claim 
for the status of the Māori language. So Mahuika wrote Pākehā, that is white uh, colonial settler New Zealanders, Pākehā consistently asked teachers of Māori and those elevating the status of Māori to the highest academic levels, where is your literature? Te Kapunga Jew, Jew's book is one answer. So also in 1974, Jews wrote that the Māori language is a living language with its own literature, prose, verse, song, poetry, or dance poetry, both written and oral, traditional and modern. And he cited the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in arguing that the denial of Māori language and literature is detrimental to the full development of the human personality. And this 1974 internal document, which was in part an application for the establishment of an inter-university Māori oral literature centre, Jews included a whakapapa, or genealogy of Māori literature, very similar to that presented by Tina Makareti in 2018. These two genealogies illustrate the continuity of Māori understandings of their cultural practices as literature and the continuing failure of the settler colonial majority to recognize these understandings. As this failure illustrates, assertions and denials of literary status are deeply political. As Jews asked in 1974, why you use English labels for Māori verbal art forms? Why not use the Māori terms? Jews' use of the term literature was strategic, a move necessary to assert the cultural status of the Māori language and culture within a colonial context in which literature equated with cultural status. But such uses also point to the term literature's shifting existence as a translingual signifier whose often contested application to new contexts is surely central to any comparative discussion of what literature means today. I'll just come out of that because it's the last of my images. Jews' presentation of Māori verbal arts as literature illustrates very clearly Alexander Beecroft's account of the way a literature can serve to give legitimacy to and even construct a language, a claim that he extends from Sheldon Pollock's argument about the intertwined emergence of Sanskrit as a language in a literature. However, the Māori example also illustrates the limits of both these accounts. Whereas Pollock emphasizes written literature as a key is key to the notion of a language and of writing to the notion of literature, Beecroft argues that literature in the contemporary world is medium independent and can be equally conveyed by any medium from print to the internet. However, the forms of media that are granted the status of language and literature are never neutral, but are always geopolitically and culturally inflected and contested. As Tuhi Y. Smith notes, writing has been viewed as the mark of a superior cult civilization and other societies have been judged by this, this view to be incapable of thinking critically and objectively or having distance from ideas and emotions. Hence, for example, tapa and other similar bark skin cloths made in many Pacific islands for kairo or carving and tāmoko, tattooing and other forms have all been understood by Māori and Pacific scholars as texts to be read. And yet these forms, along with many others around the world, remain largely outside what is understood as literature within our discipline and within literary studies departments in New Zealand universities. Māori scholars, Alice Te Punga Samavou and Ngāhuia Te Awe Kotuku, for instance, have both spoken and written about the disciplinary divides that led them, despite their records of scholarly work in literary studies and art history, to find disciplinary homes in indigenous studies departments where they have felt free to discuss art and literature alongside tāmoko and tapa and other media and literary forms. And yet, there's equally a problem, of course, with subsuming these various art forms within the term literature and the purview of comparative literature. In doing so here, I risk contributing to the further expansion of a vociferous discipline that gobbles up various cultural forms and subsumes them subsumes them under an imperialist account of literature. Hence, the problem is not just differing approaches to literature, but also differing approaches to comparison. Who does the comparing from what perspective and to what end? Definitions of literature are deeply intertwined with modes of comparison, an implicit or explicit normative frame of reference for literature, often based on an Anglo-American or European canon, reproduces the assumptions on which it is based even when it avowedly sets out to develop a comparative approach that avoids such parochialism. 
See, for example, Eric Hayo's relatively recent foremost account of modern literature's world-making possibilities, which ends up reproducing a schema of realist, romanticist, and modernist world-making modes. As César Domingue, Horn Saucy and Dario Gruen Nevo put it, the issue is how to adopt a point of view without allowing it to obliterate other points of view. This is the issue of comparison with which indigenous researchers such as Tuhi Wai Smith have struggled because settler colonial attempts to understand their point of view have in fact often only ended up mobilizing their material to affirm the settler colonial point of view, so obliterating the viewpoints of, indig of indigenous peoples. The relativity of any perspective of comparison is or ought to be foundational to our discipline. It's easy enough to agree with Domingue, Sorsi and Vinerva that in, historic, in a historical and culturally alert view, world literature certainly cannot be confused with an average or minimum of cultural specificity or with a cultural production aimed at a uniform world market. And yet the world market of scholarship on comparative literature, world literature and global modernism exists. New perspectives are often adopted merely in order to obtain a competitive advantage in the world market of academic discourse, rather than to force each of us writing from each of our perspectives to listen, rethink, adjust. While comparative literature, global modernism and world literature as mobilized as terms and methods in the English speaking academy have all been undeniably expansionary, vociferous even in their geographic reach, they tend to be limited by their own self-sustaining disciplinary logic, whereby any change to the discipline must emerge in response to the existing discourse of the discipline. This disciplinary internal disciplinary dynamic is evident, for instance, in my recent experience of planning an international conference in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I recently discussed with other co-organizers the importance of featuring a Māori keynote speaker and more generally Māori in out of the indigenous perspectives. How in brain, however, in brainstorming possible speakers, I encountered the objection that those whom we invite, might invite would not have sufficient familiarity with or interest in finding out about the recent canonical conversations concerning comparative and world literature and global modernism. One scholar was mentioned as a possibility precisely because they had encountered Susan Stanford Freeman's work and had begun to engage with that work on global modernism. I hope you understand I'm not here casting any aspersions of the important necessary work of scholars such as Susan Stanford Friedman or my colleagues in Aotearoa New Zealand to engage with the work. What this anecdote instead highlights is a structural problem that places a handbrake on the possible reimagining of a discipline, let alone the idea of creating a new way of thinking altogether. That is, important Māori scholars who are doing work that I think could help upend existing disciplinary assumptions cannot enter and change the discipline because their work is situated outside it. However, if they were to enter the disciplinary conversation about say global modernism or world literature, their work would arguably lose precisely the extra disciplinary power to upend current assumptions. As Domingue Sorsi and Wenneva observe of Franco Moretti's account of world literature, world literature is one of those concepts that without examples is inane, but once it has been understood through examples, it runs the risk of becoming hostage to this or that prestigious example. A similar problem attends disciplinary conversations about world literature, comparative literature, and global modernism in general. New literary and theoretical material can only be accepted if it conforms to the already existing assumptions of the field. One way to combat this tendency is to choose to keep, uh, as Domingue Sorsi and Pinueva suggest, is to keep uh, on adding concepts, letting them cancel out or reinforce the influence that they may severally have on the general concept. When it comes to these concepts, the more challenging and resistant, the better. But this move, while necessary to challenge preconceptions, seems still to keep the researcher at the center and risks repeating the kind of exploitative colonizing extraction industry that has made research such a dirty word for indigenous people who have often um, been chosen by race, white researchers, most obviously anthropologists, for their challenging and resistance example. Instead, I hope this paper will prompt others to go out and read these and other Indigenous scholars and writers and to learn from them, to upend through their myriad and other myriad 
through their and myriad other perspectives, the basic disciplinary assumptions, which all too often merely repeat the geopolitical reality ongoing for most of the world's population of colonialism and empire. I'll leave it there. I think I'm out of time. Well, thank you, Jacob, um, for that very timely uh, intervention uh, to let us hear uh, from your presentations, you know, Maori language uh, in such prominent ways, uh, you know, and to uh, kind of expose the structural inequities of uh, comparative literature as a discipline, whether you um, engage or disengage, <laughs> you know, the paradox of that. Thank you very much. Um, our next pre presenter is Professor uh, Sun Jie Liang, or as in East Asian practice, Liang Sun Jie. And he is the president of the Comparative Literature Association of Republic of China on Taiwan, and currently professor of English, as well as professor of Graduate Institute of European Cultures and Tourism at National Taiwan Normal University. He's the author of such books as the Birth of Language in Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, uh, as well as uh, Following the Animal, Derrida's Cat, Suskin's Frog, and Kutz's Dog. And uh, he works on, as you can see from the titles, he, his main uh, research interests include Irish literature, uh, deconstructionism, and animal studies, as well as medieval British literature. Uh, Professor uh, Sun Jie Liang's uh, presentation today is entitled Complete in Taiwan, colon, essentially incomplete. So complete, complete. Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, Sumei, for the uh, introduction. And thank you for having me here in this panel. Um, so I will simply read from my paper. <clears throat> So since the birth of comparative literature, death has been shadowing its growth and development. Scholars of this field seem to be constantly required to sustain the anxiety of an academic discipline whose identity is perpetually precarious. The indeterminacy of identity, however, is essentially rooted in Taiwan culture and literature because of a history of colonization by the Dutch, Spanish, Chinese, and Japanese, and recently the geopolitical tensions between the US and China, with Taiwan being part of the first island chain. So um, the first island chain is, is a, it's not really a, a chain, but it's a kind of defensive line, strategic line, um, leading from Japan through Taiwan to South China Sea. Um, so the in-betweenness of Taiwan's geopolitical position also features the comparative literature studies in Taiwan. This presentation will map out a historical development of the comparative literature studies in Taiwan, demonstrate the current local debates is a dying and content that complete studies in Taiwan corresponding to taiwanese which is inherently embedded by creolism syncretism and hybridization will continue to live on in a way that will never be completed. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is not so much an academic presentation today um, as a uh, report or a personal observation of the status quo of the uh, comparative literature in Taiwan. So my, my main point is the fate of comparative literature in Taiwan follows the fate Taiwan, if we consider the working of geopolitics in the Pacific region. Taiwan has been politically dominated by several regimes. According to the official historical records before Dutch colonization, there was a trans-tribal alliance called Big Belly Kingdom, a very lovely name. Um, the kingdom was conquered by the Qin Dynasty in 1732, and Taiwan had been colonized by the Dutch and the Spanish and the kingdom of Toning in the 17th century, and subsequently by the Qin Dynasty from late 17th century to late 19th century until 1895. 
and by the Japanese government from 1895 to 1945. When Japan was defeated in the Second World War, the Republic of China began to rule Taiwan from 1945 to the present. Taiwan was nothing but an island of natural resources sent by the past colonizers until around some time after the beginning of the Cold War. Thanks to the geostrategic foreign policy of the Truman government of the United States in 1947, that is um, the containment policy. Truman pledged that the United States would help any nation resist communism in order to prevent its spread. The policy corresponds to the rim land theory proposed by Nicholas Spickman in 1945. The Rimland is an intermediate region lying between the heartland and the marginal sea powers. As the amphibious buffer zone between the land powers and sea powers, it must defend itself from both sides, the cause of its fundamental security problems. Between the end of World War II and the Korean War, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur praised Taiwan, located at the midpoint of the first island chain, as an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Taiwan as an important military strategic position in the first island chain against China was officially recognized in 1954, when the United States and the ROC agreed to the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty. The geographical position of Taiwan not only helps to secure the peace in the Asia Pacific region, but also determines the future development of the comparative literature in Taiwan. When Taiwan became a strategic partner of the containment policy, the US understandably has begun to exert influences, promoting American cultures and literature, enhancing academic exchanges, encouraging translation and circulating the magazine USA Today in Taiwan. So during the uh, 1960s and 70s, the ROC as quote, the legitimate cultural stronghold of Chinese tradition, end quote, maintained an authoritarian single party government while its economy became industrialized and technology oriented. This rapid economic growth known as the Taiwan miracle was mainly supported by the US funds and demands for Taiwanese products. However, Taiwan Miracle did not guarantee a stable international status. So in 1971, the United Nations General Assembly passed the resolution which recognized the People's Republic of China as, quote, the only legitimate representative of China to the United Nations, end quote, and removed the ROC from the United Nations. In 1973, Comparative Literature Association of the Republic of China, abbreviated as CLARAC, was founded. So you can see um, the political coincidence in this timing. The objective, as John Deeney, an American scholar teaching at several universities in Taiwan, one of the uh, Clarak initiators, said in his presentation in the first quadrennial international comparative literature conference held in Taiwan. Quote, hereby we propose a new perspective since these ideas originated from scholars interested in Chinese literature and comparative literature. We call them the Chinese school of comparative literature, end quote. While comparative literary studies with the emphasis on Chinese literature dominated in the 70s, the nativist literature debate took place in late 1977. Taiwan's nativist literature debate was an ideological debate in the name of literature. And also a second time an ideological struggle started around the idea of the native in Taiwan. An earlier nativist literature debate took place in the 1930s at a time when the native meant Taiwan as a colony. And the object of criticism 
was Japanese colonialism. The core values of the 1977 nativist literature debate, on the other hand, were anti-empire, anti-colonialism, and nationalism. And the debate challenged the sovereignty of the anti-communist pro-US nationalist party. The literary debate was intervened and suppressed by the ruling party in 1978 and in 1979, a crackdown on pro-democracy demonstrations that occurred in Kaohsiung, that is the uh, um, southern part of Taiwan, historically called the Formosa incident, naturally silenced and ended the nativist debate. The end of the nativist debate, however, inaugurated the awakening of Taiwanese consciousness, which helped Taiwan literature almost non-existent and mostly unjustly vulgarized under the ruling of nationalist party since 1945. Finds its way into the research topics of the comparative literature in Taiwan. The development of the comparative literature took a turn in 1980s from textual studies to newly emerging literary theories. And soon after in 1990, took another turn to cultural studies. Those scholars still working within the discipline of comparative literature have since focused on the cutting edge theories, which are not necessarily straightforwardly connected with the so-called literature. Um, for example, quantum theories, string theories, or um, Anthropocene. In 2013, Clarak newsletter published a series of special issues on the status quo of comparative literature in Taiwan. All the contributors acknowledged that conflict has broken down traditional barriers between different disciplines and broached the possibilities of useful research topics in keeping with the spread of globalization. However, the uh, general observation of its status quo is that conflict in Taiwan has completed its historical mission. And therefore its time has gone. With the dwindling of the institutional resources, conflict has become specterized, that become a ghost, a specter. Some scholars argue, even though that is the case, a reincarnation is always possible. So the first one, when we talk about a specter, is following you know, Derrida's idea. And the second one about the uh, second life is following uh, Bayamin's idea in keeping with the uh, translation theory. So consequently, if comparative literature as a discipline wants to live on in Taiwan, it has to take on another form of life. That is to say, with recourse to Gregory Bayson's idea of the shift of logical type, or uh, what he called a deutero learning, which means that from learning to learning to learn. <clears throat> complete needs to be upgraded to complete 2.0 with a new institutional body continuing to break down barriers at a higher level of epistemological system. So one might argue, yes, comparison lives on, but it is at the expense of the death of literature. In terms of the geographical position of Taiwan as the midpoint of the first island chain, complex in Taiwan, right from its nascent stage, is tied together with the dynamic geopolitics between the US and China. The development of complex in Taiwan has more or less parallel with that in the US. However, one thing is different. Taiwan literature is essentially comparative literature. And the study of Taiwan literature as a whole is essentially a hybridization of the American school and the French school. With the multifarious cultural backgrounds when it comes to Taiwan literature, we cannot understand it like the way we understand say American literature, English literature, uh, German literature, et cetera. All of which are basically monolingual literature. While well, Taiwan literature can be written in Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese, and indigenous languages, 
or a hybridization of any two or more of them. Creolism and syncretism are common linguistic features. So let me conclude by using the example of a Taiwan indigenous award-winning writer, Shaman Rampoan. He is Dao tribe and grew up in Orchid Island. Um, it's an offshore island, very, very small offshore island in the Pacific Ocean, about 90 kilometers away from Taiwan. He received his education in Taiwan with a PhD degree in Taiwan literature. By the end of his autobiographical novel, Matatuwata, which means the eyes of the ocean. He said, quote, I do my thinking in Tao language and translate my thinking into Chinese language when I write. My spirit, my body, my knowledge are nurtured by the ocean. And what he usually criticizes is that you know, most of the people around the world are thinking from the land perspective. And what he is advocating is to think from the perspective of the ocean, because the ocean has no national boundary. So translation is a site where at least two heterogeneous cultures encounter. Translation to Rampoan is like complete to Taiwan. If translation is subject to a political contingency, what kind of second life can it create. The second life is not necessarily a good life, but it is still a life. The survival of conflict in Taiwan, to some extent, indicates the survival of Taiwan. Therefore, referring to the title of my report, if Taiwan's situation is constantly redefined by the superpowers in the geopolitical conflicts, how can conflict in Taiwan be possible to be completed. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sun Shi, for this um, you know, really uh, spot on presentation that addresses the question of geopolitics, like all the presentations we've heard uh, today in the past two days, but especially uh, this one showing the connection between geopolitics and comparative literature. Um, so from uh, three settler colonies, relatively recent countries uh, in the world to perhaps the oldest uh, country in the world, Egypt, our final presentation today is by um, a prominent uh, Egyptian scholar of comparative literature, uh, Marie-Thérèse uh, Abdelmasih, uh, who has published uh, very widely in inter-art and intermedial uh, studies. She uh, is a professor at the University of Cairo. She studied uh, there also at the University of Cairo, as well as at the Universities of Essex and the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And uh, she was a visiting scholar at Keynes College, uh, University of Kent. She was the founding director of the MA program uh, in, the in the College of Graduate Studies, um, MA program in Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies. Um, at the uh, University of Qu at Kuwait University, and she was also acting vice dean of for academic affairs and research uh, there. She is an elected member of the executive committee of the International Comparative Literature Association and the International Advisory Board and associate editors of CLC Web, and uh, an elected member also of the board of trustees of the International Prize of Arabic uh, fiction, which is one of the most uh, prestigious uh, prizes in Arabic literature today. Uh, she is also on the advisory board of the National Center for Translation in Cairo, one of the largest uh, really uh, translation uh, enterprises in the Arab uh, world. She is uh, listed uh, on the profiles of prominent Egyptian women, uh, which is uh, coordinated by the Women and Memory Forum uh, in Egypt. Her uh, presentation is entitled Translatability of Arabic, a Transdisciplinary Comparative Approach in the Egyptian Context. So, Marie-Therese, please. Hello, this is Marie-Therese Abdelmessia from Cairo University. 
I'd like to express my thanks to Wa'il Hassan and Shumay Shi for organizing this seminar and inviting me to participate in it, and my appreciation to participants in the seminar for their enriching presentations. The title of my research will deal with the translatability of Arabic, uh, which contests advocations for a single master language, which reflect a political agenda. I will be using a transdisciplinary approach that will deal with literary texts along with art creations, the verbal and the visual, as against the conventional comparative approach in Arabic focusing on the literary. I begin with Abdel Kabir Khatibi's fictional translation in Love in Two Languages that configures the encounter with the other as an, as an intermarriage between two histories and cultures, Moroccan, Arabic, and French. His off offshoot or child is a third language belonging to none. This Can we to be stop for a second because we're not seeing the video. Tech support, we're not seeing the video. Okay. Uh, are you not seeing the slides? No, it was all black. Okay, okay. And also, can you spotlight the speaker who is in presence? Yes, yes she is, there she is. Um, I think we should start from the beginning again. Are you able to see? No, it's still black. I begin. We can see it now, but not the slide by itself. Shall we just stick to that? Yes, now it's working. Okay, so shall we, can we start from the beginning, please? All right, thank you. You want me to read? Yes, let's do that. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, that might be a better idea, actually. Okay. Be. Okay, so you hear me, all of you? Yes, very well. Okay, so the title is Translatability of Arabic, a Transdisciplinary Comparative Approach in the Egyptian Context. Um, um, and uh, I chose this title because I really want to work on literature and art together. Uh, from a comparative perspective, which is something really not done, uh, um, not done at all, perhaps in the Arabic context. Next. I begin with Abdel Kabir Khatibi's fictional translation in Love in Two Languages that configures the encounter with the other as, in, as an intermarriage between two histories and cultures, Moroccan, Arabic, and French. His off offshoot or child is a third language belonging to none. This is to be connected with the Egyptian-French cultural encounter during the Napoleonic campaign, a cross-cultural encounter that contributed to the discovery of ancient Egypt and obliterated memory. This requires cross-cultural and intracultural translations of double alterity. Um, I'm proposing a transdisciplinary comparative framework because um, there is, we have here a cultural exchange based on recursive looping. Mm -hmm. It says definition uh, of recursive loop looping, or he, he proposes that uh, recursive looping requires a transdisciplinary comparative framework that traces the translatability of any language or culture in its interactions with verbal and visual foreign or domestic languages. His um, definition of trans translatability conceives of it as an interpenetration of different cultures and intracultural levels while covering all kinds of translations. 
Archaeological vestiges, vestiges produced verbal visual texts and objects that undermine the idea that language is only verbal. And of course, we know that the hieroglyph is visual verbal. There is a constant mirroring between both that determine reciprocal modifications and also reading Egyptian uh, panels in the tombs combines both visual and verbal. Mm -hmm. So the objectives of this research is to trace the translatability of Arabic to undermine political manipulations supported by a homogenized language politic politicizing culture to its ends and for grounding prominent figures whose translation <coughs> attempts have contributed the involvement of literary and artistic products, verbal visual language systems in Arabic. Um, verbal visual readings initiated with the science of Egyptology, um, which was introduced in France by Champollion and Rifa Tahtawi in Egypt. Rifa was an imam from Al Azhar, the oldest theological institution in the Middle East. Al Tahtawi's translational framework dealt with double otherness, French into Arabic and ancient Egyptian into Arabic, within, of course, a legitimate frame of reference based in a conservative discourse. So Ahmed Kamel picks up the um, and, um, Al Tahtawi's project and domesticates ancient Egyptian um, by crossing disciplinary borders, he was enabled to compile a 16 volume dictionary of Egyptian with Arabic and French translations, a translational process aiming to trace the roots of Arabic and Hebrew in ancient Egyptian language. The recovery of obliterate, ob, an obliterated past, along with the exposure to a visual verbal language, became the major scholarly concern among major critics. Muhammad Abdu, another imam from Al Azhar, introduced inter art studies in his work to justify the legality of visual practices that were banned by radical believers. And he speculated that. Um, the purge of figurative representations in the early years of Islam combated long-standing native idolatry practices. Once these practices have ceased to be, there was no fear of apostasy. On the other hand, Muhammad Abdu dealt with otherness as modes of translation, whereby Arabic transposes the foreign culture into its own. Uh, as such, the, um, translation would suture disciplinary borders by integrating Arabic literary studies, Egyptology, and art. And that was a very positive initiative that had ne negative consequences by inflaming a cultural rift dividing two histories, pre-Arab con conquest and the post. The next um, prominent literary critic was Abbas al Aqad, who um, was highly engaged with Islamic studies. And nevertheless, he published also widely in the field of inter art studies, art history, and art critical reviews. The cultural rift between past and present, foreign and domestic, was bridged in his critical writings not by assimilating other cultures but by self monitoring the local culture, self-monitoring how? By taking a critical stand of both. So along with the literary critics enhancing the visual in language, our artists in Egypt bridge the past-present chasm in their works. 
The following images will give you samples of what was realized then, and I introduce just very few uh, of the most prominent um, artists. This is Mahmoud Saeed, this famous painting, um, The City, referring to the city of Alexandria. And these are the girls of Alexandria. And this is Samir Rafa. And I put his painting along with the Sphinx because it it's actually um, inspired by the Sphinx, but has of, and bears very deep meanings. And this is Mahmoud Mukhtar, the Khamasin, the storm, um, a storm in Egypt that lasts, a sandstorm that lasts for 50 days. And there's this woman trying to um, protect herself from the storm. There's Tahaya Hal. who was uh, very much inspired by Nubian art. And this is Yunan, Ramses Yunan, a serialist, one of the famous serialists. I uh, pause a bit uh, to um, give you a chance to look at Mahmoud Mukhtar's Egypt Awakening. Uh, which is actually representing a peasant woman, um, representing Egypt, of course, uh, rise, resting on a rising spin, sphinx to be the enlivened by his power. And she's relying on the sphinx to, to, to look to the future. She is, uh, has her hand uh, risen above the forehead in anticipation of the future. Technically, Mukhtar here combines ancient Egyptian and classical artistic tradition. And may I remind you that the combination between ancient Egyptian and, and, and classical traditions was very prominent in, uh, or, or, or in, in the, the movement um, from the Ptolemaic period to the Renaissance. Um, well, we, we can speak about that later. Later on, I have to move on. Uh, so this statue actually um, evoked or ignited really uh, a heated local and global uh, argument over its structural and aesthetic properties along with its ethical validity. Moreover, it retained an ambivalent status being representative of an other suppressed self which was revived, or by some other, some other interpreters, it was an, it represented an alien culture that hasn't got to do anything with Egypt. And of course, this was uh, the attitude by by radical groups who rejected it by branding uh, this style as pharaonism or Arabism, which they considered as remnants of the pre-Islamic Dark Ages. Sin addressed this challenge in his seminal book, The Future of Culture in Egypt, and his project was based on two principles, translating the past into the present and the reconfiguration of the local culture through a cross-cultural translatability. He was reframing collective memory to engage individual participation. The rich modernist movement in literature and art, the verbal visual, drove literary critics to develop inter-art studies. Sahir al-Qalamawi introduced Gottel Ibrahim Lessons Lakun on the limits of painting and poetry to her readers and university students. In her courses, she outlined the translatability of the figurative when being connoted in the literary. This liaison reconnects with Khatibi's Amour Bilong whose offshoot is a third language that belongs to none, a process of translatability. 
Correspondingly, meaning derived from the literary figurative text or verbal visual text belongs to neither. We can't say this meaning is expressed by words or this meaning is expressed by images. They are both one and the same thing. To conclude, unless we determine the intracultural and cross-cultural translatability of Arabic in response to geopolitical shifts, modern and contemporary movements in verse and fiction will not earn local and global public appraisal. The proliferation of free verse poetic movements, hypertext, multimodal narratives, as much as they enriched Arabic, their creators have remained vulnerable to what their forebears endured in their confrontations with radicalism. Therefore, tracking processes of translatability of Arabic entices us to revisit it as a fertile linguistic medium that ceaselessly establishes connections across verbal and visual systems. Thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Therese, uh, for this uh, very interesting, uh, you know, presentation, which takes us in a, a, a different direction, really, which is the question of inter art um, and you know uh, comparative uh, relations. So uh, we the uh, floor is open uh, for a discussion. Please uh, put your questions in the Q and A. And, um, and I will uh, read them. Um, uh, as you, uh, people uh, perhaps uh, compose their questions, let me uh, start with uh, perhaps an idea that has threaded through all three sessions so far. And, and that is the idea of the space of the nation as itself being a comparative uh, space. The idea, for example, first presented by uh, José Luis Jobim, that uh, quoting Antonio Candido, that to study Brazilian literature is to study comparative literature. And that's because of the inevitability, really, of talking about uh, Brazilian literature in that case without reference to uh, either Portuguese or French or other uh, European literatures and variations on that came came up. Uh, the same thing had been said about Arabic literature by Abdel Fattah Kilito from uh, from Morocco. The idea came up again in uh, Ipshita's discussion of Indian uh, literature, which is of course uh, internally comparative, even without reference to to English and and so on. And it continued today um, as well in. Um, in Irene's uh, discussion of uh, Canadian literature uh, and also in Jacob's uh, discussion of, uh, of New Zealand, even though he presented us really with the resistance to the idea of comparison there at the same time that comparison seems to be a necessary uh, condition. And, and I think, uh, I mean, there of course, you know, the idea also came up in, in, in um, in Sun Shi's discussion of Taiwan, but, but I mean, I think what we see here is perhaps a certain tension in, uh, in the discipline, uh, the idea of comparative literature as a perspective that is indispensable, uh, that is uh, hospitable, that is open, that, is, uh, that, that we uh, cannot uh, really avoid, but, um, but, but at the same time, the practice of comparative literature, which has always necessarily been limited, and, and narrow, and, and in a sense, the history of the discipline in this country as well as elsewhere has been a matter of bringing the practice in line with the theory. Uh, how can we make comp our practice, our, our, our uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the way we do comparative literature um, more in line with the theoretical ambition of the, compar the comparative perspective? Uh, how to make it more open, how to make it, uh, and, and I think th this is the sort of the fundamental tension really that's uh, within comparative literature that spurs this ongoing sense of crisis that we've referenced uh, repeatedly, but also the 
continuous self-reflection, which has enabled the discipline to uh, broaden itself uh, so much. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody would like to take up this idea and, um, and, and, and uh, so elaborate on this inherent tension, which is driving you know, the whole exercise of the uh, decennial state of the discipline uh, report and it has, has really been embedded in all of our discussions over the uh, past three days. Um, I, uh, we have a question here, I think, in fact, already in the, uh, uh, in, in, the in the chat from Ayman Dusuki. Many thanks for the inspiring presentations. Uh, I've got a question for Jacob. How is the question of orality dealt with? Uh, here, a course on orality, orality and literary thought is an attempt to rethink the languages of theory the evolutionary model of literary history. Okay, um, perhaps Ayman, would you like to ask your uh, question? Um, <clears throat> sure, thank you, Well, and thanks everyone. Sorry, it, uh, I was trying to type fast, uh, but it's just simply, uh, I was quite fascinated by uh, the challenges and the potential for, for contribution uh, in the way uh, Jacob outlined the case of Maori literature. And because we're introducing here, we've actually introduced a new course on orality and literary thought precisely to rethink the languages of theory and um, evolution, evolutionary models of literary history. Uh, also, as we know, uh, uh, oral practices have their own temporality, which tend to be those of cultural memory. And also the very conception of the literary the word, the phrase, the stylistic feature are all complex social codes. Uh, so the very even conception of language itself has to be uh, rethought. Just to put it very briefly, but thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't uh, claim to be an expert on on oral literature and Maori oral literature at all, but I think, <clears throat> um, inciting the example of Jews in the in the in the nine seventies, I think um, there's two ways we can think about this. So one is kind of historically the kind of development of the idea of orality, um, um, and I think you know Horn Saucy's book on the um, ethnology of um, ethnography of rhythm is 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 good in tracking some of those kind of developments within the kind of Western. Uh, context, um, uh, but uh, but alongside that, I think you're also right that that if we if we look to oral traditions, we you know then draw into question a whole lot of the assumptions around what literature is, um, and and one of the things I was doing to sort of pick up on what Marie um, was was saying too that that when we talk about oral traditions, we don't always often think about the kind of visual aspects. But uh, certainly within, you know, my, my small knowledge of, of Māori uh, tradition, carving, um, weaving, um, and other visual art practices that we might, we might call it, describe them as those, uh, are also seen as, as holding oral stories, memories, and so forth too, so that, so that the... Um, so that we immediately have to think across media and, and, and um, rethink our whole kind of conception of what, um, of, of media too, I think. So. Mm. Mm. That's a may, um, the question of orality concerns, of course, all literatures and, and uh, probably, especially in settler colonies, having to do with indigenous uh, literatures and uh, cultural expressions. So Canada, Taiwan, uh, especially being the examples here. So my, my question is in some ways continuing some of the things that I've been thinking in terms of the limits of American comparative literature throughout these last three days. And today in specific consideration of US being a settler colony, and comparative literature as a discipline have, having not confronted its own settler colonial unconscious. And so, um, and so I was thinking that in the US, it has really much to do with disciplinary uh, 
divisions between Complet and English. So in Complet, uh, we encourage our students to study national languages and literatures from outside the United States, when these languages actually are well and alive in the United States as well, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, we do not study uh, our own indigenous literatures in comparative literature departments. And so the tension between plurality as we understand it outside the national context uh, and how that gets privileged, but the internal plurality within the US, internal multilingualism uh, is suppressed uh, in complete as it is practiced as a discipline in the United States in order to distinguish itself from English uh, departments and also from American studies. And, and hence its own sort of, uh, in some ways, you know, kind of uh, ignorance or sanctioned ignorance about US empire, uh, about US settler colonialism, uh, you know. And so I'm curious, you know, since we have three scholars from settler colonies, whether you might want to uh, address how that might be, uh, can it be in some ways, a kind of uh, global indigenous, a global settler colonial kind of point of relationality uh, in the study of comparative literature or uh, from your standpoint, what can you offer us in the United States and uh, how we might uh, do this better? Thank you. I guess I can start by saying just briefly um, a few words because I think we have limited time. Uh, in the context of settler colonialism, uh, Canadian literature, in fact, is uh, situated rather uniquely because it offers two sites um, located in two ling different linguistic and cultural spheres, right? So we talk about Anglophone and Francophone cultures and literatures and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think that was the, uh, the starting point in understanding um, the inherent comparatism of Canadian literature as, as, as perhaps as um, national kind of corpus, right? Literary corpus. Uh, with regard to um, settler colonial state and with regard to indigeneity, um, you know, I just want to say that as a non-Indigenous scholar, I have, and many of us have to be aware of our self-positioning and our perspective, right? So for example, talking about ind indigenization of comparative literature, which I believe is uh, perhaps slowly starting to um, be explored. I'll be careful with how I say that, right, in, in Canada. And so it, it raises a number of questions. Um, who has the right to compare, right? Who has the right to translate? How do we teach indigenous literatures and cultures? Because the issue of indigenization of curriculum has been very, very prominent in Canada. So how do we go about this project? How do we integrate? indigenous literatures and cultures into our curriculum. It's a very complex issue. And I think it involves a lot of um, political sensitivity, a lot of cultural sensitivity, and um, a lot of ethical issues that are still in the process, I think, of being um, considered, right, explored, um, but it definitely is taking place. So um, I'm going to stop here. I, I would agree completely with what um, Irene said. I think the same issues and ethical questions go um, from the perspective here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I think um, I definitely would not want to um, claim to speak or offer anything related to an Indigenous perspective because there are Māori scholars and writers, thinkers who can do that. And we should be, as the point of my paper was, we should be listening to them, not me. Um, I think that we have from a settler colonial perspective, like in the another set colonial society like the United States, which is also an empire now, we have shared problems and think disciplinary problems too. Uh, so one of those um, 
uh, it, it, this, compared to literature hardly exists in New Zealand. There's, there's one um, program that's, that's the only one as far as I know that ever, has ever existed in New Zealand at Auckland University and that is um, in a very tenuous state. Um, but, but, you know, uh, we have English and then, and then you know, so-called, um, uh, well, oft, often, you know, languages, which have been traditionally thought as foreign languages, but of course, as in the United States, there are there are people, many speakers of those of many of those languages here, but again, we have exactly the same problem you described, and I think, uh, and 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 in the states, where where the literature from elsewhere is taught, but not the literature of the place and the multiple languages that exist here. Um, and at the same time, indigenous studies um, has been become the home for many of the indigenous scholars, Maori scholars, who and Pacific scholars uh, working um, in this area, and one of the prop. So that that's really important because they they need their autonomy and their place to speak from. But one of the problems is that that has allowed, I think, people in English departments to kind of go on as as they were ignoring um, the the ignoring those perspectives because they exist elsewhere. With, and so I think that kind of siloing of disciplines is a problem. And I think one of the ways to tr try and ethically kind of address this is to seek out. I guess modes of, of ethical collaboration um, across those disciplinary divides. So across from English to um, indigenous studies, at least I see that as a kind of practical first step speaking from my perspective here. Uh, Sunshi, would you like to uh, add anything um, answering Shu made question? Um, just now I end my presentation by using the example of the indigenous writer, uh, Shaman Rampoan. And I think from his perspective, from his perspective from the uh, um, Orchid Island, I think that we can offer something. Let me say something about uh, previously about the establishment of the uh, PhD programs of um, comparative literature in Taiwan. So that's exactly the same thing as the development of the comparative literature um, along with the development of the USA. And as I said just now, um, usually in Taiwan, when we talk about comparative literature, it's always the result of the conflict between the US and China. That is always the case. And because we have been defined by this geo strategic and geopolitical situation. So I suppose that there is really nothing that we can offer from Taiwan. Um, but that kind of thinking, because, because, um, Comparative literature is basically a national literature that it goes with uh, the nationality. It goes with how we define our own country. And if we consider the uh, status quo of Taiwan in international community, that it has only about 16 countries with diplomatic relations. And so it, its status is simply like, um, like a comparative literature in Taiwan. And, but if we think of Orchid Island, if we go from Taiwan to Orchid Island, it's an offshore island, as I said just now, about 90 kilometers from, from Taiwan, then um, we can think from the perspective of the ocean it's not the uh, perspective of the land, which is a, a, a mode of thinking of two dimensional. It's basically three dimensional. And it's, it's, it can open to all the possibilities that there is no boundaries. And boundaries is basically the way that we define what nationality is. So if we follow Grandpa's idea, then he has a very interesting um, experience um, because he speak Tao language rather than Taiwanese or, or Chinese or Japanese, but Tao language is a totally different language. Um, so when he visited um, some other foreign islands far, far away in, in uh, the other, um, many, many far away. And, and he find out that he can still somehow communicate with the indigenous people there. They share something that is really beyond nationality, beyond the national border, that they can communicate somehow with vocabularies, with um, 
a very simple sentences, even though they do not, in the past, they did not really learn the other people's language, but still they can communicate. And I suppose that is kind of a super structure, super linguistic structure that we are looking for. Um, if we want to understand the spirit of comparative literature that we need to understand from the perspective of the ocean. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. There's a question from Ipshita for uh, Marie-Thérèse. Uh, how do you see the whole issue of untranslatability when there is change in media, between media, and, uh, so to speak? Well, uh, actually, uh, the term translatability, uh, actually, there's a slash between un and translatability in the sense that in every process of translatability, there is something lost in the middle. And this is what I try to refer to by quoting Khatibi. Um, and so um, the idea of change from media to, to another um, nowadays doesn't pre preoccupy us much because we are now um, uh, in, in the theoretical framework of multimodality in the sense that all medium, all media, are multimodal, they are visual and verbal. So if you change, for instance, from art, visual art to literature, like for instance, the theme of Egypt's awakening, which was dealt with in several literary works in, in Egyptian Arabic, uh, they, 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 they share the same motif, but they, uh, they, translated or interpreted in their respective media. So um, um, actually the idea that something is untranslatable is not very accurate because one has to ex ex expect a space, a gap always between different medium. And I think that the space or this gap is the point where we get together we don't get together by identifying our thoughts or identifying our, our ideas. We get together through a, a moment of silence where we reach a point we, 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 can't, really, um, uh, we can't really identify. You see that we, we all, and, and, and this I think is what uh, generates tolerance that we, we know that we can communicate but there's a certain point where we cannot communicate. And, and, and it's, it's this gap, I mean, this gap is what really uh, um, is, is the most important thing that we, 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 we understand that there is a gap and we uh, still go on conversing. I don't know if I made myself clear, but... Uh, uh, this is this is it because then uh, the concept of untranslatability is is it expects a linear logic. It, it it doesn't allow for floating ideas for uh, for um, things which you which not everything is speakable, not everything you can say in words, uh, and, and this is what art is about, and this is what literature even is about in their different ways. So that, I, I would add that this is what difference is about too. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. perfectly, yes. Okay. Uh, Amar has a question, would you like to ask? Yeah, sure, thank, um, thank you for the wonderful presentations. I just have a question that actually um, I, um, uh, Irene and I, um, I, uh, uh, Sanchi also and uh, Jacob raised the universal, uh, the, uh, the neoliberalism of the university that's impacting our research, the way we conduct the sense of accountability to the state, that, you know, the sense of um, the rise or the sense of a push against, you know, um, all of these issues. And I was wondering if you have anything to say about how that impacts our positionalities in Canada, in Taiwan, in the US, overseas, in Egypt. Um, as we relate to what we do and um, how we think about comparative literature today. 
uh, can you can you repeat the first part of the question? I I, I hardly uh, got it. Can you repeat please the first part of the question? So I, I think this was um, 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 I think Irene you raised this about in relation to the um, indigenization of um, uh, comparative literature in Canada, especially specifically to be I mean in relation to indigenous communities. And then he also mentioned something about the new liberal university and how that impacts how we approach comparative literature. And in fact, that impacts all the work we do, whether you're in comparative world literature or literary studies. Jacob, you mentioned that in New Zealand. And I was just wondering in what ways are there pathways out of the new liberal thought or are we going to be stuck with it um, as, a, um, as a philosophy of how we approach our, these concerns? Do you want to go first? Uh, can, I, can I answer from my perspective, yeah. although I'm, I come from a different area? I, I think, I think in, in our society, what, what relates with the indigenous will be the popular. Uh, and the popular uh, in Egypt especially is uh, like considered uh, a low language, uh, like something which is completely different from uh, the, the, the master literature or the master language. And so I, th I think we have the same problem, we share the same problem with you that the, the popular is not represented. And, and, and when, I was, uh, when I was dealing really with uh, Egyptology and art and all that, it's because it, these areas are not approached in comparative literature. And so I think, I think the problem of comparative literature is that it is confining itself within the, the, the literary and the mainstream literary. But once we uh, uh, start uh, looking into um, indigenous literature, popular literature, uh, obliterated memories, uh, then we are dealing with, with, with other forms of difference, mm -hmm. not stuck to just one, which again, I, I, as I understand what you said, would be part of a hegemonic culture or a new liberal uh, capitalism. That's that's how I conceive of it, and maybe this gives uh, a chance to uh, my other uh, colleagues to continue. Thank you very much. I, I think we have unfortunately come to the end of uh, the time, and I'm being told by tech support that we have to end here. So uh, I can't thank you enough for this very lively discussion, very engaged uh, and, and thought provoking uh, uh, conversation over uh, the course of this seminar. So thank you all. And we hope to continue this conversation at, at some other forum. Thank you all. And please attend ACLA 2022 in Taiwan, hosted by uh, Professor Sun Jie Liang and his colleagues as our local hosts. So big thank you to him and his colleagues and thank you to all the presenters and participants and attendees uh, for these three days.